Hi, uh, my name is Richard Smith, and I'm the curator here at the Fullerton Museum Center. We're sitting in the Leo Fender Gallery, and this is the room that we call the Biography Room. It's where we keep some of the artifacts from Leo's early days here in Fullerton, including a radio that he made at the radio shop, and k &F amplifier and guitar set, and a very early Stratocaster. Uh, what we're going to do is, is watch a, an 8 millimeter home movie that was done at the Fender factory in 1957. It was taken by Forrest White, who was the plant manager, who had worked for Fender from 1954, and uh, he was a real music fan. I think early on he saw the, the importance of what Fender was doing, and he was really kind of caught up in the whole history of, of Fender early on, and was able to document the company with his collection of catalogs and also with his uh, photographs that he saved, and with his home movie. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting to think that a guy gets a a camera and the first thing he does is he takes it to work to show you know to document what's going on at work but he really loved the guitars and he really loved the guitar factory and he loved working with Leo so without any further ado let's go back to 1957 and watch a home movie taken at the Fender plant at the corner of Raymond and Valencia here in downtown Fullerton and uh, and see what we can learn about how Fender guitars were made in the old days this is the Fender um, factory right downtown. This is at Raymond in Valencia, and I think that's Ioni Lambert. She was a woman who worked in the office. She's one of the secretaries. Oh, this is Ioni Lambert here with the dress on. Cool microphone, too. That's a good blues harp microphone right there on the counter. This really was a home movie, as you can tell. I mean, you know, that's <laughs> the professional production quality is not really up to speed. You see a picture of Jimmy Bryant back there on the wall? That's a pretty common picture of Jimmy. Got Leo's photo gear, his photo floods there against the against the wall next to the desk, behind the desk. Doing the books. A lot of people talk about Leo about how, how he's in a, he had a cash flow problem. Is what his problem was. He he was making a lot of money, but the cash flow was the problem. He had a hard time keeping everybody employed year round because it was seasonal. They there's a Fender price sheet sitting on the desk. I think this is probably Leo's desk. It could be Forrest's. A little chart there for tools. Smile for the camera. <laughs> it's a quarter to five. Look at the clock on the on the uh, desk there. Working late. This is the inside of the factory, and you can see the the the, uh, the racks they had. Not too unlike what they had, uh, what they still have. Of course, they now they're all air conditioned and, and climate controlled. Back then, and obviously, they had the big fans set up. Later on, I think we see some of those fans by the doors. The guys were not uh, modest. They uh, just went ahead and worked without shirts on. You can see a punch press how it works. You don't want to get your fingers stuck in there. They're making a cover plates. It looked like a cover plate for a bass. That could have been a cover plate for a steel guitar, but I think it was that one was for a precision bass. Cleaning up the edges on a pickguard, a Telecaster pickguard. Oh, that's an Esquire pickguard, isn't it? Because only there's no cutout for the. Here we have. Now this is Leo's lab. There's Leo, pocket protector in place. Got a prototype Jazzmaster sitting on the on the uh, table in front of him. He worked just exactly like this at GNL. This is this Lyman Race, Race and Olmsted uh, Tool and Die Company. Here's Freddie playing the prototype. Now this is an interesting guitar because has a Strat vibrato. Uh, it has multi-pole pickups. Those are seven poles instead of six, and the strings go between the poles. The whole idea there was to smooth out the sound, to kind of reduce the attack. You know, the attack that everybody <laughs> loves on Fender guitars, that's what he was trying to eliminate. Trying to achieve the dinka dinka sound, as Leo would say. That's the jazz tone, dinka dinka. Back at the factory, shipping and receiving, Modern architecture. You got the Ford pickup truck. Leo would uh, they'd load this up and send it down to Randall down in Santa Ana, and that's where the stuff was shipped from.
to the dealers. Looks like they're sorting out cables for steel guitars there on the floor. This is the cabinet shop, the wood storage in the background. Forrest went crazy when he started at Fender trying to keep track of all the parts because they were making steel guitars, making amplifiers, they're making Spanish guitars, and making basses. He wanted to get a some kind of, some of a standardization to that. Have it all filed away and all, all stored logically. That was one of his big problems, was getting all the parts put where they could find them. Here's using the saw. As you can tell, uh, this could be a dangerous operation as well. Sanding the amplifier cabinets looks like basement. Looks like a basement cabinet. Pin routing. If I'm not mistaken, this is the back of a steel guitar. It's Fred Fullerton. That's uh, George Fullerton's dad. Is this a Telecaster body? Uh, you, you be the judge. It's either a Tele or some other Fender guitar. Looking good. They're working on necks. Working on the headstock there. You know, a lot of emphasis has been on uh, the hand quality of these early guitars. There, a lot of operations have changed now. They're using the, you know, the numerically controlled computer now to cut most of the stuff at the factory, which makes everything exactly exactly the same. And you can see the variations, even with those steel templates and. Everything that they did to, to make everything uniform, there's still a little variations. Not a big assembly line. This is uh, pretty much one at a time. Still no uh, conveyor belts like they have now. They have this pretty elaborate system in the new factory at Fender. And like I said, this is seasonal. There you go to see this, the uh, the fans working over time, cutting the contours on the strap body. Or I'm not. I excuse me, sanding the contours, not cutting them. Big belt at sander. Leo and George made a lot of these tools. Uh, they didn't just go out and buy them. They actually had to had to figure out how to how to uh, do it right and then make their own setup. Here we got winding pickups. Leo used to always say that the the women that worked for him that wound pickups could wind them tighter than uh, than any of the machines they used later on, any of the uh, automated ways of doing it. This is the neck department. A lot has been made. A lot of attention has been paid to the dates that they put on these necks. That's Lloyd tuning. Lloyd worked for Leo for for decades. He uh, he ended up at GNL in the 1990s before he passed away, and he uh, he was a great guy. Used to see him all all the time down at GNL. Sanding the back of a strat neck, it looks like. Spray booth. Notice no uh, respirators, no uh, air control, no. Uh, no way to guard from breathing all of that lacquer. And then here the the finished sanding, probably with rubbing compound. Getting an idea of the, the amount of work they're doing. This is a 
Working. Looks like this looks like a Duo Sonic, doesn't it? Not sure about what that. Uh, I like the Western shirt though. And here we go. I believe that's Gene Galleon. He worked at the factory quite a while. Some of the other guys sitting around taking a taking a break. It's amazing how many people smoked. <laughs> I guess that that had something to do with the pre CBS. Yeah, and like I said, this, the the jobs were seasonal for the most part. They uh, Forrest said that he had a very hard time keeping these guys working all year. They'd get their big orders at the summer trade shows, and then they'd be busy into the fall, and then they'd get all that stuff shipped out before Christmas, and then in the first part of the year, the first half of the year, they you know they they'd have to lay people off. That looks to me like a custom color Stratocaster in the making. A little bit of uh, fine sanding there between coats. The other thing that was really interesting at the Fender factory is that everybody had skills to work at any job virtually. I mean, these girls would be sanding one day, and then the next day they'd be, you know, making, uh, making, uh, doing other. Other things like working in the uh, the amplifiers, you know, wiring chassis, winding pickups. Winding pickups was, was a specialty. That was a, that took some learning how to do, a lot of practice, a lot of repetition. Forrest was very proud of this. Uh, that, that this is Abigail right here, I believe. Silverworks Defender Custom Shop. As I was saying, Forrest was very, very interested in uh, in the uh, technology of his uh, his movie camera. And it's really unfortunate that he didn't did take more pictures and um, didn't wasn't able to just kind of like show us some of the other things that were going on at the time. And, and it's really too bad there's no sound involved. But this is setting up a strat bridge. It's Gene Galleon again tuning up a strat. I think he's got a strobe tuner there on the on the desk on the uh, his workbench, but uh, I'm not sure. Polishing up a strat. That's what they used to look like. Pretty cool. I think this is uh, this is George, isn't it? George Fullerton. Checking out strat. Final inspection. Non trim model. A lot to be made about, about the uh, quality control at Fender. They they are very concerned about quality control all the time, but nevertheless, nevertheless, a lot of stuff got through that wouldn't necessarily get through today. This is putting tweed on an on an amp cabinet. I think that's a 410 basement again. You can put the adhesive on the the uh, tweed fabric and then just just slap it on there. You can see the. Uh, the knot, the knots in the in the wood, the pine cabinets there. Of course, the uh, off gassing from those from those knots would stain the uh, stain the tweed under underneath them, and so it would be uh, it would be marked, especially true with the Tolex. You could really see where the knots were. Look at that soldering iron. That's industrial strength, boy. Let me tell you, I would hate to get myself burnt by that thing. Uh, permanent, permanent damage. Plug in the chassis. 
Some of those amps got shipped with the original uh, tape on the on the power cord there. It's still intact. Here we are. That's see, the 410 basement. There you go. Four speakers. Those Blue Jensen's. Where's that amp today? Looks like a twin, doesn't it? I think so. Four power tube twin. Or maybe that's two rectifier tubes and two uh, power tubes. That's hard to say. Yeah, that's what it is. The speakers are staggered too. The nicest pair of Levi's on in the entire factory right there, folks. 501 X. The shipping boxes, where are they now? <laughs> this is uh, this is Alvino Ray, he's one of Leo's best friends. Related to the King family, the King sisters, married to one of the King sisters. Probably the uh, most underrated steel player of his generation. He was really, really good. And he was a very good Spanish guitar player as well. And he helped Leo develop the Fender 1000, which he's, this is the prototype right here. Uh, probably did more to influence Leo uh, probably along with Noel Boggs, they were Leo's biggest influence on steel guitars. They used the pedals, but they didn't play the pedals the same way players today would use the pedals. They basically used the pedals to change the tuning of the neck instead of playing the pedals individually. Here's this pretty cool Stratocaster. I don't think the guitar's plugged in, is it? <laughs> I think Leo's listening very carefully and watching a guitar that's not... Oh, Thumbs Carlisle. This is pretty wild, isn't it? A lot of you guys haven't seen this. This is Thumbs uh, working out on a on a Stratocaster. And you can get voicings in this that you couldn't get any other way. Very unique style of playing. Metal pick guard. Blonde finish. There's the fiddle. Leo had this electric fiddle going as early as 1952. I think this is one of the early prototypes for the pickup. Uh, later on, you know, he would introduce this, the, uh, the the electric violin, but uh, this is the prototype. Now this is Noel Mogg standing out in the parking lot. Got the old station wagon in the background, and you got a Fender 1000, and then you have the four neck Fender uh, Stringmaster. Now what? Noel is doing there is he's demonstrating how those pedals change the tunings of the necks so you can get almost any tuning imaginable with the six or seven floor pedals. He's tuning his uh, his four neck. One of those necks is tuned uh, in a bass register. There's Leo. We think that that's Leo's Chrysler Imperial in back. We're not sure about that but that that's Little California license plates. Leo went nowhere without a uh, pocket protector. He was always prepared. And they're not trying to get close up to the feet, they're trying to get close up to the pedals there. This is a this is a late spring. You can tell by the weeds in the background there. This is George and Freddie, both very accomplished guitar players. Freddie, of course, played with the the uh, Royal Hawaiians, the Harry Owens Band in Hawaii. He was born in in Maui. Came to California with Harry Owens. This is Roy Lanham playing on the uh, Roy Lanham on the left playing the prototype. Not sure who the guy with the uh, scarf around his neck is, but uh, he sure is having fun. I don't see any chords coming out of those guitars. <laughs> Looks to me like they're not plugged in, but the hang tag. 
Aha, and this is this is Leo's only recreation right here, this boat. This is a Chris Craft. I think he docked it to down at Newport Beach. Interesting fact is that Don Randall and Leo Fender were partners for what over twenty years. Leo never flew in one of Don's planes and Don never went boating with Leo in one of his boats. They just didn't hang out together. Leo was very, very proud of this boat. He had several over the years. Leo at the helm, pocket protector in place, heading out. They used to take these weekend trips to Catalina. That was a, a fun weekend for them. Go out to Avalon and I don't know if they'd stay overnight or, or not, if they'd just uh, go out there for the day. It's a, it takes an hour and a half, two hours to get out there this way. I found out about this video in, in the 1980s when uh, when Forrest and I were having lunch together one day. He, he said, yeah, well, I, I'm going to be putting out a video. And I go, really, what is it? And he goes, well, it's a home movie I made in 1957 at the Fender Factory. He goes, and it has a, scenes of, of, of Leo out on his boat pulling into Avalon Harbor there, the casino going by, hills in the background really hasn't changed much in the last uh, 50 years. There's one of the seaplanes that used to go there. That, now they don't do the seaplanes anymore. Those are, those are gone. That's a Wrigley Mansion up there on the top of the hill. New shirt, new pocket protector, all ready to go. Leo really was an excellent photographer. That's his first wife, Esther. Oh no, that's Joanne. That's, excuse me, that's Joanne White, and that's Curtis White. There's Esther in the background laughing. This is Forrest. Visiting. I'm not sure who he's with here in this picture. This is uh, Speedy West on the left and Roy Lanham and Jerry Bird goofing it. Being goofy, I guess, is the best way to describe this. <laughs> They're at one of, the, one of the NAM shows or one of the trade shows back east. I, I think it's probably the NAM show at the Palmer House. I'm not absolutely sure about that. There's no way to really to know. Um, Roy Lanham and Speedy, of course, were endorsing Fender, and Jerry Bird was endorsing Rickenbacker at the time. And these guys just palled around, boy. They they had a lot of fun. You can see they're, they're at the Fender booth here, the Fender instruments in the background. This is the famous Lucite Stratocaster that uh, did, in fact, resurface in the 1980s, I think, with different hardware. I'm not sure about that. But you can see that the stand that it's on is lit. Uh, they went to great lengths to make this guitar out of Lucite. So you could see exactly what was going on inside. The Fender booth. The very cool curtain in the background. Custom color Strat there. Music Master. A couple of Music Masters. 
all the tweet amps. Fender Strat, Fender Mandolin, gold plated Strat, the blonde, uh, blonde finish, uh, otherwise known as the Mary Kay model, kind of informally. Here we have uh, Fred McCord on the right, Don Randall on the far left there playing some chords. He never let on that he played guitar, but he looks like he's doing fine. Got a couple of the salesmen playing with him. You've got Don Patton and Bob Dayton. I'm pretty sure it's Dayton playing a bass around the corner. They're going to show him here in a second. Notice the gray chords coming out of the guitars. There we go, playing a precision bass. That very likely is a prototype for the uh, revised Precision 57. Very likely the prototype. You see the vibes in the background? Leo told me that once that he was going to make uh, a set of electric vibes for Lionel Hampton. I don't know if that ever happened or not. This close up of Randall, non trim strat. I think that's the thing that's amazing is how much fun these guys were having the, the entire time they're working, but they're having a lot of fun doing it. I think that was one of the keys, the keys to success there. This is a Rickenbacker booth. Horace was pretty friendly with all the other manufacturers. That's F.C. Hall standing up and uh, of course Jerry Bird playing steel. Jerry Bird is probably the finest Hawaiian guitar player of his generation. And uh, Rickenbacker, he played a Rickenbacker from the very beginning back in the 30s. He had an old pre-war Bakelite model. He's one of the Rickenbacker salesmen. Forrest was real good friends with uh, Jerry Bird and one of his biggest fans. Forrest loves steel guitar, you know, as Leo did. And you can really, you can hear, hear the steel guitar in the Fender guitar. It's just, it's just there, the influence and the tone and just the whole approach to the Spanish guitar coming from the Hawaiian guitar. I mean, it just looks lyrical. This, you see his vibrato and how smooth it is. Those are Rickenbacker prototypes. It's really one of the unfortunate things in the Fender story, of course, is, is how F.C. Hall and Leo kind of falling out about things. And uh, you can see the F.C. just kept plowing away. He never gave up. This is Barney Kessel. The K guitar, the K Kessel model. These are the, the guys at Martin. D28 there. Beautiful guitar. Chet Atkins is at the Gretsch booth. Thumb pick.
I think that's a white falcon hanging up in the background, isn't it? Single cutaway white falcon. Jimmy Webster with his touch technique on the, the uh, fingerboard. It's pretty radical. I was uh, down at the museum, Fullerton Museum, this afternoon, and uh, there's a 14 year old kid working on <laughs> doing all the Eddie Van Halen stuff. And uh, little did he know, little, little do the guitar players know that this technique was perfected in the 50s. Of course, not used exactly the same way, but you, you can tell right there that he was a master of it. Well, that just about wraps it up, the home movie of the uh, 1957 Fender Guitar Factory. I hope everybody enjoyed it. I think it's a really an important document, and I hope that we all learned something about how they made Fender guitars in the old days. Thanks.